We're here today because Australia, you know, we've run this exact lecture with a few tweaks at several PAXs in the past, starting in 08. You might think, oh, we're recycling, but... We are we, recycling. We talked to a lot of gamers we figure none of you know who we are, and you've never been to PAX. This is new to you. So I can tell the same jokes that no one will know. Right. But the real reason we wanted to bring this old panel back to you, right, is that in, you know, I'm sure you guys play a lot of indie video games, especially with your PC culture, right? In the U.S., we have a lot of indie tabletop RPGs, which we love. But I am not so sure that those have made it to Australia. So we wanted to spread the love of them to Now, you. we tested this on the tram here. The tram was 90% PAX people. And we're on the tram, and we meet this guy. He's a super tabletop gamer. He's talking about Pathfinder. I'm like, all right, I'm going to list for you the names of games we're talking about in this panel. Have you ever heard of anything? And none of them. So I think we're in a good place I here. think we're in a good place. Now, we did add something to this panel, and that's where we're going to start right here. But when we first ran this at PAX 2008, we ran it right after the Dungeons and Dragons is Awesome panel. <laughs> they thought that these two panels would go together. No. We kind of shed all over Dungeons and Dragons for an hour. And, and we're going to shed all over Dungeons and Dragons for an hour. But for the first 20 minutes, people in the audience were like clenching their fists, like, how dare these guys? Like, Rrr. Right, so because they love D&D so much, if you take a poop on it, they feel like personally offended, like you have insulted this thing I've spent years on. But I love D&D. D&D is like a formative part of my life. I played D&D since I was in like third grade. D&D, oh. &D, I had characters I took from second ed to third ed, not to fourth ed. I went to nerd, I went to, <laughs> I went to nerdy summer camp, right? And in nerdy summer camp at dinner, they would list the activities for after dinner. And the number one activity was, quote, adventure games, which meant go on the picnic tables behind the, uh, whatever it is, cafeteria and play D&D. So, and that was second ed. Second so we want to be very clear. This all comes with love. <laughs> we, I love Dungeons and Dragons, I love everything that it is, and I'm about to take a crap over it and my childhood for the next hour. Don't so, hate. let's begin. Role-playing games, that's what we're talking about, right? What is a role-playing game? Well, Dungeons and Dragons, the title of this panel, Beyond Dungeons and Dragons. And we use that term to describe Dungeons and Dragons. But we also use that term to describe that. Right, and what does that really have in common with Dungeons and Dragons? You have these characters, and they have some stats. And that's pretty much it, right? I mean, the story is not different. Cecil goes through his transformation whether you like it or not. I guess unless you stop playing. Maybe. But there's so many games out there that people call a role-playing game, and you look at the whole category of everything that's called a role-playing game, and these things like don't even resemble each other. How do they have the same label? Now, it makes I am, no sense. I am playing a role in this game. I'm taking this character, they're going through all the motions. Well, characters. But most of the game is this sort of combat game that's kind of separate from the role-playing part. I mean, you don't watch a movie and there's a thousand random encounters along the way. So obviously, we're not talking about this when we talk about Dungeons & Dragons. Because really, that is the extent of the role-playing in a traditional role-playing game. Dost thou love me? The trick here is that no matter what you answer, you are forced to answer yes. Yeah, if you say no, she says, but thou must, and you have to answer again. I could say that this is some sort of allegory for relationships, but... What about this? That's role-playing, isn't it? It is indeed role-playing. Kenneth Brown, I was playing the role of Hamlet, but I don't think Shakespeare was rolling dice when he made Hamlet. I don't think Kenneth that. Brown was rolling any dice either. So we've got a game where Maybe there Vin Diesel isn't Hamlet. <laughs> or there isn't really any role-playing. We've got role-playing where there isn't really a game. Now, we know we're talking about that. That is what this panel is about. That I is, had hair. That is our gaming group. It's a bunch of people in their pajamas, sitting around a table, funny-shaped dice, uh, nachos, everything. So we're talking about this, but the word role-playing game covers so many different things that we really need to define the term. Because if we don't define the term, it's really easy for us to get way off track in our discussion. But even further, we keep using that word game. <laughs> I figured Princess Bride would go well over here. <laughs> we don't even have a good definition of the word game. I mean, patty cake's a game. Yeah, what kind of game is patty cake, though? I mean, is there a winner? Is there a loser? Can you mess up? When one plays patty cake, everyone loses. <laughs> or is it Roger Rabbit patty cake? I mean, poker's covered in that. We, gave, we were talking at a convention called Magfest in the US, and a woman in the audience took umbrage with the fact that we wanted to define the term game for the purpose of discussion because, and I quote, I watch movies with my friends and we consider that a game. If you look at the dictionary, that could definitely be a game. It's like an amusement or whatever, right? Candyland, I mean, you think Candyland's obviously a game, but in Candyland, no one makes any decisions. All you do is reveal cards and move the thing, determining, you know, based on what the cards say. No one decides anything. There's no decision or anything. It's, it's just play it out and see who wins. You can just flip over the whole deck of cards and be like, Grim wins. Now, too many people, when they want to, as soon as someone starts trying to define, well, I'm going to make a definition of game, 
they start using that to exclude other kinds of games or somehow denigrate those other kinds yeah, of games. Like, usually, oh, you're not a gamer. Yeah, usually they're trying to make a no true Scotsman argument. Like, you know, people will be like, oh, that's not a sport. That is a sport. And what they're trying to say is I respect that activity. I do not respect that activity. Right? Oh, I respect that as a game. Yeah, that's I like that one. I don't like that. I don't want to call that a game because then it's, you know, we're not trying to do that, right? You know, all of these various activities are even, you know, watching movies we don't consider to be a game. That doesn't mean we don't think watching movies is a good way to spend your time, right? We're just trying to have a discussion about a particular subset of things that many people call games. So we need some sort of word to narrow it in so there's no confusion that we're actually talking about something else. Now, the trouble really is the word game. It's an ancient word. It's been used for a long time here for a lot of different things. I mean, if I hunt pheasants, pheasants, that is also game. So Richard Garfield, you may have heard of him. He, you know, Magic the Gathering, Android Netrunner, kind of a famous dude in game design. He coined a term, and that term is ortho game. The book in which he coined this term is a, what's the, uh, characteristics, characteristics of games. games. That book is like our Bible, basically. If any of you are aspiring game designers, go buy Richard Garfield's book, Characteristics of Games, and read it cover to cover. It, it looks like a boring textbook, but it's actually the best book. Now, he covers ortho games exclusively. The definitions of games we use, we really use three definitions. An interactive amusement, a series of interesting decisions, or a competitive test of skill. And he decided to make a new word for that. An ortho game is a competition between two or more players using a set of rules and a method of ranking. Poker, chess, football. Suddenly we have a word, and now we know that Pluto is not a game in this context. Right, Candyland is not a game, Patty Cake is not a game, if we're going by ortho game, and we just don't want to say ortho game every time, because it's annoying. So he coined this term, and it's a very useful term, but his book very pointedly only covers these kinds of games. It doesn't cover role-playing games. So we needed a word for these other kinds of games. So we want to commit a little bit of hubris, and we've tried to coin a term, ideal game. So if an ortho game is defined by this, he chose ortho because ortho is the prefix for sort of straight. Uh, he uses it to mean a straight or pure or true game. And ideo means unique or personal. So a series of interesting decisions that produce a personal outcome. Dungeons and Dragons does that. Uh, Mass Effect does that to a degree. In fact, notice some of these games recently, people play them for the story, and then they even let you turn off the game part because the choose your own adventure story is all anyone actually cares about. Yeah, but Final Fantasy wouldn't really work up to this, right? Sure, you might make some interesting decisions, but it's not a personal outcome, right? Final Fantasy VII ends the same way for everyone in this room. There's no personal about it whatsoever, right? You might have a personal reaction to it, but that could be said for anything. Yeah, so it doesn't really count. So the kinds of games we're talking about for the rest of this lecture are ideal games, but even that is just a high-level category. So I'm going to answer the next question for you, and then we're going to proceed. Conflict. Conflict is the answer to the next two questions. What makes a good story? Star Wars seems to be the theme in every PAX keynote ever, so I figured we'd go along with that. I assumed, and it would be. Yeah. So the whole point of a story like Star Wars is that there is conflict between these characters. That is why we watch it. We're not interested as much in the conflict between us and George Lucas. Some of you might be, but not everybody. You know, the conflicts are internal, they're external. It's like basic literature, one-on-one -on -one action here, right? What drives a good game? Also conflict. conflict. But it is conflict between the player and the game, or the player and another player. Nobody goes home or goes to their friends and tells about the story of how Billy and Jimmy saved that stupid girlfriend from those whatever. No one tells that story. The story is, yo, Scott, I beat Double Dragon last Holy night. Holy shit, what happens at the end? Uh, you get credits, and that's it. <laughs> I beat Double Dragon. You know Luke what? beat the Emperor. Spoilers. I beat Double Dragon. <laughs> All right? You see how the conflict, right, in a sort of an ortho game, like Double Dragon, which isn't even really an ortho game because it's not between two players, right? But it's still, you know, more of a game, not too much role-playing, is all about you in the real world, right? You beating this thing. I got the high score at Space Invaders, right? I beat Rim at a game of Puerto Rico. I beat Rim at Magic the Gathering, right? But when you play D&D, &D, it's my character went and rescued the whatever, right? Suddenly you're inside the story is the things that matter, right? That personal outcome. Yeah, you don't win Dungeons and Dragons, at least in the sense of an ortho game. You want to find the conflict in the fantasy, not the conflict of you trying to conquer you know, and improve your skills. So if we boil all this down and take all these concepts together, this is our proposed definition of a role-playing game that we will use for the rest of this panel. Because really, 
Why do we play role-playing games? Because we're trying to tell cool stories, but simultaneously, we're not good storytellers, and with all of that combined, we're also gamers, and we want to play a game. So a role-playing game is nothing more than a mechanism of conflict resolution in order to facilitate collaborative storytelling. Right, I mean, anyone can just sit down and tell a story. It's pretty easy, even if you're bad at it, right? And good writers can tell stories, because that's what they're good at, right? But me and Rim, we're computer people. We can't really I can't tell, tell story. stories really well at all, right? But maybe if we get together, we can have a lot of fun coming up with a story together. Maybe someone's a good writer, maybe no one is, but it's, it's a good time, right? It's like, okay, you know, I want the guy to go and kill the dragon. That would be so awesome. It's so keep this definition in your head for the whole rest of this. This is how we're defining the term role-playing game, because that is what we're talking about. We're not talking about Final Fantasy. And I just want to point out, yes, I did Photoshop my friends from the D&D group onto that Star Wars picture. <laughs> I don't think they know that we showed that picture at all these conventions all around the world. Except they were at the last time we did this. One of them a week was. Ago, the Captain guy Big the right there is the yeah, only one. Captain Giant Head. So the whole point of this is that role-playing games let us make our own goddamn Star Wars. So, let's talk about some concepts of role-playing games. Because we're going to build to actually taking some examples from existing role-playing games you might not have heard of that do the kinds of things we're talking about. Role-playing game tends to have a game master up at the top. I've stolen all this from the Bayou Tapestry. We have our PCs over here, and we have the world, the environment, the obstacles. Right, the conflict that we're resolving here is the conflict between the player characters, right, and the things in the world that aren't necessarily players, right? You know, deep, dark dungeons and horrible monsters and traps of all kinds, right, are all represented on the right. And how is the conflict resolved, right? We have a mechanism of conflict resolution, King Harold up there. Now wait, we're about to crap over D&D. We haven't really crapped on it yet. D&D does not help us tell good stories. D&D is mostly terrible at that. And you're all thinking right now, but I've told great stories with D&D, and so have we. We have. It wasn't the game that was doing that, because you can't evaluate a role-playing game by your experiences alone. You can only evaluate it by what is actually written in that book. Right. You know, a lot of people try and tell me, you know, I say D&D is not a role-playing game, or it's a bad role-playing game, and they're like, no, I just had the greatest D&D session, we have this great story going, everything's amazing. And I'm like, that's all you. What part of that did D&D make happen? And they can't tell me. Right? They just come up with some other excuse. Listen, we can roleplay Monopoly. Good sir, get off my Atlantic Avenue. Post haste. Him and Hobbit, I'm playing a right? crazy guy. Does my that, character doesn't want money. Right? Does that make Monopoly a role-playing game? Because we can role-play, we can create a good story around the game of Monopoly. That doesn't mean Monopoly is a role-playing game. You're giving Monopoly credit for the thing that you did all on your own. It was you all along. <laughs> right? D&D is the magic feather. You don't need D&D to fly. You don't. You can fly on your own. You don't need this weird system that all it really does is tell you how to move around in the dungeon and stab things. So my character before, he's confronted through the Game Master with this world. We're going to have some conflict. What is my character? My character is literally nothing more than that in Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> now you might think, I think they're laughing at the fin up in the corner. <laughs> now you might think that your yeah, character has a lot going on, but that is really all that's there. And we're not just talking about Dungeons & Dragons. Pathfinder, uh, pretty much uh, Werewolf, Gerbs. all Gerbs. these games are basically mechanically sort of Call of Cthulhu, mostly the same game. They're different combat skins on what is essentially the same role playing. Right, it's like oh, in, in L five R you can die really easily and you use D tens, but in D and D you use a D twenty. It's like yeah, it's the same idea though. It's it's all yeah. You know. So if I'm going to tell the story of my character here. I'm not going to talk about my strength stat. That's not interesting. And it turns out that that's the only part of my character that is character, that is story, who he knows, what he's done, where he's going, why he fights for what he fights for. That's it. And that whole character sheet, that's it. Yeah, so, you're trying to tell me this is a role-playing game, but what percentage of it has anything to do with role-playing? That percent. And most of that is a picture. Now, you've been in this boat before. Right there under relationships, you write that Kelvin Blackstaff is your uncle. You really love Kelvin Blackstaff, don't you? It's my go-to example. You know what? We should go with Drist as your cousin. I hate That's why we should go with it. Ah, uh, we'll get to uh, that later. Yeah. So, I write down in my character sheet, in that tiny little space for character background, that Kelvin Blackstaff is my uncle. Game Master doesn't give one shit about that. That's there's no rule the in the book that says anything about that. If Calvin Blackstaff is your uncle, then you get plus one. No, there's nothing like that, right? It's just something you made up in this text area they gave to you, and nothing in the book makes that matter whatsoever. If you're going to make that matter, that's something you do on your own, not something D&D makes matter. So of all of that, how much of this does D&D make matter? Well, pretty much, that much. just race. 
That's the, that's the biggest stretch I could even make to have anything highlighted on this. So, let's talk about conflict in role-playing games, because the conflict between the characters and the conflict between the players are both very important. So, my PC runs into a guy trying to sell, I guess, some sort of cat, and a guy's got a bowl stuck on his head. That looks more like an aardvark kind of thing without a big nose. This guy know. might be an astronaut. I, I really want that head bowl. The head bowl is really easy. All right, so we want the head bowl. Now, maybe the guy doesn't want to give us the head bowl. Well, what are we going to do here? We, we have can a... buy it from him. Now, maybe we're going to start role-playing, but again, that's not the game. If we just start talking in character... And don't start telling me that D&D says make up your own rules, right? I could write make up your own rules and write it on like the last page of the Monopoly instruction manual. That doesn't mean anything. So if my character is just that character sheet, and I'm confronted with this, what does the game try to tell me to do? Well, if all I have is a hammer, then a bunch of people are going to end up dead. <laughs> Everything highlighted in red only applies to killing people with swords and hammers. And magic. There are other parts here that are also used in combat, but they can theoretically be used for non-combat in a few situations. That red stuff, just fine. Yeah, I mean, your rope skill can be used to kill people, but also to get over a trap that's not killing anyone. Right? So basically, the game is giving me all these great tools. If I want to fight with these guys and kill them and smash that ball... It's like going to be way fun. We're going to get to use all these fun stuff in the D&D book, like, oh my god, I get to kill someone? Look at all these funky dice I get to roll. Oh, yeah. I'm rolling tons of dice, I'm using all this stuff on my character sheet, and a bunch of people die. <laughs> I got a bolt now for my head. But if I want to talk to the guy, maybe I roll a diplomacy check. One line on the whole sheet? How satisfying is that? I roll one dice. He gives you the ball in the head. Roll one dice. He doesn't give you the ball in the head. And if we just role play it out, which a lot of GMs are like, oh, just role play it out, and then see where it goes. And what did we need any of this page for? We could have just not played this game and just role played it out. And more importantly, that moves the context up. It's not just character versus character. It ends up being player versus player. You've all been in this boat. The guy has a three charisma, and yet somehow he's always getting everything he wants all the time. Because in the, in the real world, he has charisma, right? Your real world charisma matters when the game doesn't make it not matter, right? Your real world intelligence in solving puzzles matters when the game doesn't make your low intelligence in the game matter. So there's a field of game theory called mechanism design, and it's the idea that the rules of the game influence the behavior that players take within the game. So think about the mechanism design of Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. It basically gets you to play World of Warcraft on a table with a bunch of dice. So the only way around this, the only way to get past this situation, is to put some rails in place. The game master will just say yes, just start talking with you, just make the, smooth over the part that you're interested in, so that the game can just continue, either by letting you kill them, or by letting you role play it out. The game doesn't let you, within the rules itself, freely explore the interactions in an interesting way. Yeah, if you try to go and, you know, do your own thing, make up your own rules, you know, go where the GM doesn't want you to go, not kill things, Right? The game gets all messed up, the GM doesn't have anything prepared, oh my god, what are we going to do? Some highly skilled GM can make something up, but the game didn't help him with that, he even helped him with that. Yeah, and if you're, that, why do you think there's so many panels and all these cons about how to be a great game master? How to deal with problematic players? Yeah, if the game is good, you don't have to be a great game master. You might not even need a game master at all, and the game will be amazing every single time you put it on the table. Because the game did it. Some genius game designer came up with it, not some piss-ass D&D game designer. Piss-ass? Yeah, whatever. Piss-ass. That's it. So I'm trying to be nicer. So what about when a player or a player's character wants to fight with another player's character? We're going left in this dungeon. The no, we're old going man, right. We're the going old right. man in town said, always go to the west, and left is westish. That old man is crazy. My character refuses to go that way. The crazy old men are always right. I refuse. What are you going to do about it? I'm going left. So now what? Do we let our PCs fight? Well, Dungeons and Dragons like games suck at that. Player versus player fighting, one, is really uninteresting, two, doubly uninteresting for the people not involved, three, has no interesting consequences unless you kill the other person. And of course, you kill the other person, you now have this horrible metagame consequence, right? People get upset IRL, right? They, you know, they don't want to make a new character, they work, they've been spending, investing so much time in this game, and now you've ruined the whole thing with your fight, and who would really kill someone because they wanted to go left and the other person would go right? Would you kill someone over that? Even if you were Maybe. evil. Even if you were like freaking, you know, chaotic evil, would you do that? Maybe. That's really what you're gonna do? No, I don't know. Now simultaneously, because there's no system around this interaction, if we choose not to fight, then again, what do we do? Roll a versus diplomacy? 
That's also really boring. Or again, use our real world charisma to convince the person, right, to go one way or the other. It also gives players an easy out. It gives a player who wants to be obstinate. My character well, wouldn't do that. And now we're gonna do it, my character wouldn't do. So now what are you gonna do? Now the game master has to take you on the full on dungeon master express. <laughs> yeah, whether you choose to go left or right, you'd be like, okay, you go left and you go right. And you end up in the same room. How about that? How convenient is that? Yeah. Okay. Now you feel stupid. <laughs> There's a reason the term railroading is probably the most commonly used word other than the, is, at, and uh, I guess chips in a forum for game masters. Maybe critical. What if the players disagree with the game master straight up? The game master sets up the dungeon, and we want to go be pirates. Well, D, you know, D and D, the solution is game master is law, and you may not disagree with him at all. Yeah, the portcullis fell behind you. You're trapped in there now. But I didn't go in. I didn't go in. You went in. <laughs> so what do we do here? There's no mechanism in D and D for the players to assert will over the dungeon master. There's no way for me to roll dice and say, yeah, tell them Blackstaff shows up. Yeah, he's my uncle, right? He lives here. No, he doesn't live here. He's not showing up. GM <laughs> says, G that's what happens. So what do we do in this situation? When the players disagree with the game master's direction, they want to explore a part of the game that the game master won't let them go. Well, a dragon blocks your path again in every possible way, and the railroad just keeps on each other. What if there's no game master? Oh my god. Now what do we do? Is a game like that? What if there's no game master and me and Scott disagree if we're going left or right? What do we do? Have a fist fight? Yeah, now we can't even have a game master to railroad us into the same room or say you're both going left or you're both going right or to somehow settle this decision. It's just me versus him in the real world arguing. And that's where the Dungeon Master Express really ends its uh, tenured career. Now. Many of you might be thinking that you love Dungeons and & Dragons, and I love it too, but our whole point here is that you should really think about if your goal is to collaboratively with your friends play a game that causes you to tell a story, what kind of story are you trying to tell? Right, now I've met people who love D&D, and I say, what do you love about it? It's like, they love going in dungeons and having combat and shooting monsters and all that stuff, and to that I say, well, D&D is the perfect game for you. Right? You want to go in there and kill monsters and roll d20s and figure out your maximum average damage, which slash or attack or you know, magic spell is going to make that happen, and then having a tank and a healer and all that World of Warcraft stuff. If you like figuring that out on paper, play D&D all you want. In fact, it's an even better game. You can play Descent. Right? I've always played Descent where you build a little dungeons. It's even better at that, right? And it has the same role-playing framework as Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah, nothing. Uh, if you want to play, and if you want little kids to play, get Hero Quest. Same thing. Just don't tell them about the secret where you, you know, monsters won't attack until you open a door so you effectively don't have to roll the dice. Yeah, we'll move on beyond that. So really, what it comes down to is that Dungeons & Dragons exists in a continuum of role-playing games, and we made this handy chart. At the top there is the authoritative game. One person is telling a story. At the bottom, collaborative. A bunch of people are telling a story, and they all have equal input. Games fall on different parts of that continuum. On the left and right, game versus role play. How mechanic heavy is the role playing game? Is there mechanisms for conflict resolution that is social? Do you roll a bunch of dice for an argument? There are games like that. Or is it purely role playing? Is it a game where there is basically no game at all except maybe you flip a coin? You mean your high school drama club? Basically. And it turns out that stuff exists all over, not just role playing games. I mean, Mario is basically just a single person, maybe two people playing a game. Jane Austen, one person telling a story, playing a role, writing it down. Whose Line Is It Anyway is kind of a game, but it's mostly kind of pre-scripted, doesn't really matter who wins, it's more role-playing. And Dungeons & Dragons really just fits right about there. Mostly a game, mostly one person telling you what the story is, you're unfolding the story. How many of you play the Dungeons & Dragons game where the pivotal plot point is going to be you're investigating some mystery? So you roll gather information. If you succeed, the Game Master tells you a couple more paragraphs and stuff. If you fail, nothing happens. You roll again, and then he tells you the two paragraphs and stuff, because <laughs> he prepared it, and he's going to tell it to you. I take 20 on that check. All right, now I'll tell you the two paragraphs I wrote down that I was just waiting to tell you. <laughs> so think about more specifically, not just what kind of story you're trying to tell, but where in this continuum do you want it to be? Do you want it to get together with a bunch of friends and make a Star Wars happen, just kind of out of the blue, like, let's see what ideas stick? you got to go to the way bottom right. Way do you have right. a vision of a story, and you want to have your friends help you make that vision happen? Do you have a story that you've already written and you just want other people to read it back to you after rolling a bunch of dice? Do you want to sit alone in your dark dungeon just, you know, enjoying a story that someone else much smarter than you wrote and you have no friends? 
I don't know what fantasy book would be good here, or I could make a joke about that fantasy book right now. I don't know. Did they know Prince of Nothing? No one here knows the Prince no, of Nothing. Oh, okay. All right, let's get to the interesting part. We're going to actually take you through a ton of games that you've probably never heard of. And probably and aren't available in your country. <laughs> Internet exists, people. Internet. All right, the shipping is going to be the same as the markup at the game store, so... So we're going to start with a game called Inspectors. Now, mm -hmm. I'm hoping many of you have seen an old movie, you might have heard of it, it's called Ghostbusters. It's a big New York movie. I don't know. So, the people are from there. This is a role-playing system that makes Ghostbusters happen. Right, you can't use, the, you know, people like to brag about D&D, &D. they try to like hit every hammer with it, you know, we can use this for any kind of story. And you see, remember in the D20 days, it was big, D20 Modern, D20 Star Wars, we can use the same set of rules for every kind of story. No, you can't. All right, Inspectors will only tell that story of a company of people running a business Right, where they work together to solve supernatural disturbances. If you do not want to tell a story about that, you, this game will not do that. It does now, only the one thing and one thing only. The really interesting mechanic about this game that I want to highlight, there's the character sheet, and there's actually not that much on it. It's mostly flavor text. They tests. actually put the rules of the game in the character sheet. They had so much leftover space. So here's the deal. If I'm a player, and I want to do something, I roll some dice. You know, athletics, uh, whatever. Yeah, it's always going to fall into one of those four skills. Academics, athletics, technology, or uh, contact. contact, right? So if you wanted to, say, uh, beat up someone on the street who wasn't giving you information, right? Because they definitely saw it, but they're walking away and they deserve a beating, right? You're going to use athletics for that, right? So I roll my dice. If I roll really well, I narrate what happens, and that's canon. That's the story now. By rolling well, by succeeding, I get control of the story for a little while. And if you fail at the roll, the GM gets control of the story for a little while. And right? he is against you. And yeah, and everything in between, right? So if you roll moderately well, it's like, okay, you get to tell the story, but the GM gets to slip in a negative aspect. Or if you roll poorly, it's like the GM tells the story, but the player gets to slip in one positive aspect. So if I'm researching the microfiche in the library to find out if the picture of the guy who we think did the murder looks the same 20 years ago and 50 years ago, if I roll a six, I narrate exactly what I found. What did you find? So it turns out that we keep finding this guy's picture going all the way back to 300 years ago. What does the guy look like? Tell me about it. Ah, uh, he's got a really long nose. No, wait, so he's actually bald. Okay. He's got kind of some stubble going on. Yeah. He's, he's, he's holding a microphone. You better watch out for that guy. He's, <laughs> he's a dangerous guy. Now, let's say I roll a one. Ah. Oh. oh, you rolled a one where you're I looking through the microfiche. Huh? Yeah, I rolled a one. Oh, while you were looking through the microfiche. Right? You heard some noises uh, around the corner in uh, the back of the library. Uh, and then you went to investigate them. Look, I don't need his permission to make him go investigate. I'm telling the story. He failed, right? You went around this corner to investigate. The door closed behind you. And now something is grabbing your neck. Oh, no. Now we can continue and get, you know, go on to the next role, right? Because there's a new conflict now. The conflict is no longer the conflict of finding the thing in the microfiche in the library. It's not the conflict of him versus the monster in the back of the library. So instead of the mechanical mechanic, Mechanical mechanic. Going back and forth, the currency of the game being hit points, damage per round, all that stuff in D&D like games, the currency is who has control over the narrative and the mechanics of the game just let you pass that currency around. So like you have a candle, whoever has the candle can talk, roll the dice to see who gets the candle. The other cool thing this game does is it has a shared space. There's a character sheet for your home base. How many of you play a game where you have a home base? You've got like these cool magic items, you've got your butler or whatever, you role play stuff out in your treehouse. The treehouse is a character here. There's rules for, hey, do we have a samouflage in the treehouse? I don't know, do we have a samouflage? Let's roll a check and find out. We do need to have one. So suddenly you don't have to worry about this minutia of do you have 108 gold pieces and 15 electric pieces in your stash? You abstract that and roll dice. Do we have the thing we need for the plot right now or not? In fact, we do. We always do. Well, no, we don't always. We don't. Primetime Adventures. Okay, so Primetime Adventures, like Inspectors, is a game that tells one and only one story, one kind of story. It makes a TV series, any sort of serial TV series, right? So it can actually cover a wide variety of genres. If you want to do Lost, the role-playing game, perfect. Game of Thrones, perfect. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You, know, you can use this for a lot of anime games if you want it to be like a, you know, a Cowboy Bebop situation, perfect, right? The mechanic we want to point out here, this is actually a card-based game, you play with a deck of playing cards, uh, is the screen presence, right? You basically, you must play nine sessions of this game for it to work, right? And the, what you do is, at the very beginning, when you make the characters, you determine your presence per episode, right? And if you think about, you know, a TV series, it's like, yeah, 
there's a lot of characters, and some episodes focus on one of them, like Simpsons, right? Yep. It's like, this is a Moses-like episode. He's just all over this episode. He's trying to get with Marge. Remember that one? Yeah. Right? Mo all so Mo has a really high screen presence in episode three. But you know, in episode four, Homer goes to Mo's bar once, and that's it, really. Maybe he gets a prank call from Bart. So his screen presence in that episode is going to be like one or two. Right? And the screen presence, the higher it is during that session, the more power you have to exert your influence on how the conflicts are resolved. So more of the scenes in the game are going to want to involve you. Other characters, if you take turns, when a character has a scene, they're going to want to get you involved in that scene so you can exert your influence and help them you know, get whatever they want in that scene or you know, and, you know, have whatever. Uh, have more cards basically available because the number is how many cards you get and such. Right? So you're going to be in more scenes. There will be more screen presence. Now, remember, we're not good at writing or telling stories, right? But there's a certain math involved in setting those screen presence numbers, right? Uh, and the people who made this game, they are good writers. They are good storytellers. That math happens to coincide with having really good pacing, right? Having really good, you know, evenly distributed character focus. So even if you're bad at writing, just by following the rules, you will tell a good story, right? You're not at least not going to get those parts wrong. The pacing will be good, and the character focus, you know, being shared equally will be good. You're going to mess up something else. Think about the problems this is already solving. I mean, like we said, the guy with a lot of charisma at the table who's talking constantly, bowling everyone over in D&D. &D. This game forces all of you to spread the story around to all the characters. No one's being left out at any point. It also forces you to really think about what does my character want. I can only have so much screen presence. Do I want to be big in this episode or that episode? And also, another kind of side, when other games do this better, this game forces you to write down who your nemesis is. So if I write Kelvin Blackstaff as my nemesis, then he is guaranteed to be in the story. It's part of the rules. He is my enemy. That you can actually use the rules. Because it's written down in the character sheet, it matters. It's not like D&D &D where you write character background and you can't force any... There's no rule about that. It's just a flavor text. Everything on here in most, all of these games is real text where there's a rule about it. If you have a connection, Kelvin Blackstaff, you can... Boom! Kelvin Blackstaff shows up in the diner. Right? It happens. He would you never say it happens, it happens. It's a rule. <laughs> as long as you have them on your sheet. Free market. Free market this, is crazy. This is a role-playing game that comes in a box, like the old D&D games. It looks like a board game. The deal with it is that it plays one kind of game very specifically. Notice the trend here. They all play one kind of game pretty specifically. Which is why you have to learn a lot of different games, so you can play a lot of different things. This is set in a space station in a post-scarcity world. Imagine a world where energy, we have infinite energy. It's Resources. basically a cyberspace, cyberpunk utopia, right, where everything is amazing and the only scarcity is physical room, right? If I die, they just reprint me and put my memories back in. I'm good to go. Right. You can't you can't die, you can't all you can have is really social, you know, currency, like people don't like you anymore. That can be a problem, right? So that's sort of a scarcity. And physical space. You live in a little tiny box, it's a space station, it's tight. Now the whole premise of the game is predicated on one question. So, with this world and with all this these resources at your disposal. What did you do today? That is the prompt. And let me tell you, watching people play this game, it goes into a dark place really quick. Yeah, and it's pretty cool because sometimes you play, and people tend to start off wacky. I've played games about cannibalism. I've played games about dentistry. I've played games yep. about you know cooking plus cannibalism. Food is a very common theme in this game. I want to start a bakery. And think about this, a post-scarcity world. In this world, if I give you a donut, you probably really like me because I gave you a donut. Unless you're gluten intolerant. But in this world, if I give you a donut, you can print a donut anytime. In fact, taking the donut is just a pain in the ass. If you give someone a gift and they accept it, you get like a huge boost in this game. Because who the hell wants gifts, right? And there's actually differences between stuff you made by hand and stuff you just printed out. And it's like, are you really good at printing? Are you really good at making stuff? There's all kinds of things. So this is a game that actually makes you really think about the sort of ramifications of a post-scarcity society. And it does it exceedingly well, and weird sci-fi comes out of this game. Right. The other thing about the game is you play it with these multiple decks of cards. Every player has a deck of cards, and it says right on the box how many of each card are in the deck, and you flip them over one at a time to sort of resolve the conflicts, right? It's like, oh, I draw a hazard card, shit. Oh, I drew a you know, genetics card, good, right? I needed that, because I'm using my genetic uh, thing on this test, this conflict, right? Um, and the thing is, you know how many are in there. You can look in the discard piles. You're like, shit, I know there's no more greens in the deck. The next thing I do, it's probably gonna fail miserably, right? So, but I need to finish the deck so I can shuffle it again to, so I can win at something. So I can choose, like, oh, I know I'm gonna fail here, right? Or maybe I'll get people to help in on the next thing I do so I know I don't fail at it. 
So success and failure are ebb and flow currencies, just like in a lot of good stories. The characters are failing and failing and failing and failing, and then suddenly they succeed at the end, and Bilbo throws, gets the ring, and Gollum doesn't eat him. Or they're, fa they're succeeding and succeeding and succeeding, and then the critical plot twist happens because they ran out of success. It makes that ebb and flow happen every time you play the game. Thousand and One Nights. Yo, dog. This game is crazy. This is a game where you play characters who themselves are playing characters in a role-playing game within the game. So, you're in a sultan's court, Thousand and One Nights, right? You're not the sultan. The sultan is this... You don't even talk to the sultan. He's not really a character. It's just sort of like this imaginary object in the game, right? That you worry. You don't want to make the sultan upset. And you also don't want to get executed or, you know, kicked out. No, you you play a character. Like, I was playing the Don Juan, the poet, the court poet. I'm this pretty boy, lover boy, that's the dude I'm playing. Yeah, I didn't play in that game, but our friend Pete did, and he was the eunuch. Mustafa bin Mustafa. Great name. <laughs> Not and racist at all. Now, the way, the way you make characters in this game is you write down, for each sense, the five senses, something about your character. He smells of lavender. He sees power in others. Whatever you want. You have to focus everything based on the senses. And for every other character sitting around the table, you write what you envy about them. So Mustafa bin Mustafa envied my virility. I envy his physical strength. It forces you to have an already existing internal relationship with every other character. So when you get to sit down and actually play the game, what happens is all of the characters are sitting in the Sultan's court talking to each other. Doing their thing. Just doing their thing. At, right, so now it's you, the real world, and you have a character. The character is Mustafa bin Mustafa, whatever, talking to the other characters. Right, You role-play this out. Eventually, during the role-playing, somebody will, in character, say, let me tell you a story about that. That and character. now, all of the characters in the game have new characters in that story. You might think it's hard to do, but it's actually incredibly easy. Like, once you sit down, and you, the book is a tiny book. You think, how can this tiny book make this happen? It's never failed to work. Yeah. Even people who are usually not good at role-playing always get it right. They remember every character's name. And not just the character that they are's name, the character in the second story's name. Right? Can't even remember D&D &D characters' names, but I can remember these guys' names, except Drist and... <laughs> you don't even know anything about the Forgotten no, 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 Realms. Forgotten Realms. No, I know about you talking about Forgotten Realms all the time. It's a big part of my life and my youth. Yeah. The other cool thing about this game, so you're playing these characters playing characters, and part of the reason it's easy is that because you're playing a character, a character is always simpler than you. At least I hope it's simpler than you. Otherwise you spend way too much time writing that backstory. So as a result, you have a very simple focus. You have this very simple lens through which to view the secondary character that that character's playing. Coupled with the fact that the character's playing a character in the context of the Sultan's Court, you get into situations where the eunuch, wanting to take the wind out of my sails, starts to tell the story of Don Juan, you know, the epic lover. And he assigns himself the role of the epic lover. He assigns me, the epic lover, the role of the eunuch to put me in my place. So now you've got a story where you got a guy role-playing a eunuch who is telling a story in which the eunuch is role-playing the Don Juan, and then you got a Grim playing a Don Juan who is in that story role-playing the eunuch. So I come onto the stage when I'm introduced, herp de dur I'm the eunuch, big and stupid, I sure wish I had balls. <laughs> I insulted him at the second level. <laughs> The book also tells you to eat figs and dates and olives and lounge while playing. We did that, because in New York you can get Turkish delivery. <laughs> this game is amazing, and I highly, it actually just recently got re-released. Recently reprinted, new edition. Yeah. Worth every dollar. Yo, dog. So Dread. Dread is the best. So Dread, again, only tells one kind of story, the survival horror story. Good thing that's a really common story. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everyone wants to play a zombie game, a Cthulhu game. That's the thing lately. Sigourney Weaver alien game. Awesome, right? Any game where, you know, you, know, you kind of, you know, uh, Blair Witch Project, anything yep. like that. Anything where it's haunted and people are dying, right? People are getting killed off throughout the story. Dread is your way to go. But they're being killed off one by one. Yeah. So, you know, whenever you go to see a survival horror story, like, well, you can stick with Alien, right? Think alien. Probably, right? It always has the same pattern to the storytelling, right? Everything's kind of chill. Something scary is going on. Tension builds, tension builds. Someone dies, tension levels off. Tension builds again, tension builds again, and it was just a cat. 
And attention builds again. Oh, yep, they get, someone got eaten. Yep, yep, yep. All right, you just keep going like that until usually there's one and or zero people left, and then the end, right? So Dread does exactly that game and only that game. How does it do it? With a Jenga tower. No dice. No dice. No card. Think about it, a Jenga tower. Tension builds, tension builds, tension builds, it falls down. So Scott, I want to kick in the door. I hear that girl screaming on the other side. All right, give me two pulls. Whatever. Ba-bam, ba-bam. You kick in the door. What's in there? I find the girl, and I rescue her, and we, we board it up behind me. Okay. You, uh, you want to... The zombies are now bashing on uh, the uh, the door that you walled up. All right, I try to fortify the door with the stuff from the fireplace. Uh, you're going to need three pulls. There's not much in that fireplace. Now, look at this Jenga. Now, you play Jenga. Over time, it gets more and more rickety. Tension is building and building and building. In the beginning of the game... I pull out a shotgun and kill all the zombies I see, and it's easy. Yeah, it's like, oh, game, yeah, I killed a zombie. Yeah, just keep killing it. At the end of the game, it's like, start the car, one pull, and I'm looking at this thing like... <laughs> if I hard. choose not to pull, I fail at what I want to do. Right, so for example, it's like, oh, you're, you're not going to pull to start the car? No, okay, car doesn't start. Zombies are now surrounding the car. You're trapped inside. Now what? Yeah, not looking so good for him, John. Here. Yeah, you should say yes next time I ask you to pull. If you knock it over, and this is a quote, <laughs> my finger. <laughs> I don't think finger is what they were thinking. I know. <laughs> if you knock it over, the book says, and I quote, your character dies in the most horrific, scene appropriate way possible. And then you get a snack because everyone else is going to keep playing. Yep. It happens. No, at the same time, you can look at that tower, look at the GM square in the face, and smash it. Yeah, I mean, you look at this thing, it's so wobbly, and I asked you for two pulls. You know you can't make the two pulls, right? And you know it's just going to get worse. Yeah, now zombies are piled up on the car so high the suspension breaks. It's like... You know, if you smash it, you succeed in the most glorious way possible, comma, and then die in the most horrific, scene appropriate way possible. <laughs> That's the whole game. That's, I mean, there's a character creation, which is like a questionnaire system where the GM basically writes questions and you answer them, and those answers are your character. And the GM can sort of make leading questions, like, oh, uh, you know, what happened to your lover last, se last season, right? So now you get to make up all this stuff about a lover. And it, you're, you're sort of open, but you're also restricted. You can come up with some clever ways of doing unexpected things, yeah. But it's mostly the Jenga Tower. Best game. So shock. Oh, snap. Social science fiction. There's actually a new shock. It's shock human contact. Also very good. It's very So similar. this game has a lot of crazy stuff going on. For one, you play two characters at all times. On the front side of your paper, you're playing your character. On the back side, you're playing the enemy of the character to your right. Remember we talked about games with no GM. This is one of those games, Well, right? it's you... not that there's no GM. It's that <laughs> there's five players, there's right. five There is GMs. no single GM, right? You go around in a circle. You're the enemy of the person to your right, and the person to your left is your enemy, and you're you. You still interact with the other people, so you don't want to just restrict it to three players, but it's mostly you and the people next to you, right? But everyone is the GM of one thing and one thing only. So when we played, I, I decided the game should have Space Pirates. So I was the GM, I owned Space Pirates. So in the course of the game, there's a question like, hey, how many Space Pirates are there in that sector? Oh, uh, there's about a million. That's totally Space Pirate land. That's their home base. My issue, the issue that I was the Game Master of, was gender politics. <laughs> it's that kind of game, the social The way fiction. the game yeah. starts, you come up with a list of five issues, and everything centers on those issues. You make the world and then play in it, and there's rules for that. Also, you set up the kinds of conflicts that can happen. In our game, all conflict, no matter what it was, had to be framed as either a space battle or sex. <laughs> and this worked. Like, every time there was a conflict, so basically you would get to your turn, you would probably have a conflict with someone else to your left or right, somewhere around, right? And that conflict, you know, you would narrate and get to the story. You had to resolve that conflict with sex or space battles, somehow. So look at this idea. Suddenly we've got a game where it's either this epic, millions of people dying, planets being destroyed, or a very intimate two people, and they're dealing with it like right in there, all on, it was the, very flash on the bridge. It was very Flash Gordon. It was the most Flash Gordon. Right. <laughs> right. But I mean, what was the situation? You were like, uh, it was like a space senator or something? Yeah, I was some evil space senator, and I was trying to do some evil bullshit. I barely remember what I was right. doing. Right, and then like, people were like sleeping with the space senator to get into the government, to manipulate it, and people were also like shooting at the space senator's house with their freaking capital ships. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mouse Guard. Do you have Mouse Guard comics in yeah. Australia? Yeah. Okay. This role playing if you're game? Not, yeah, if you're not reading Mouse Guard, that's a problem. You should. This role playing yeah. game makes the Mouse Guard comic just happen in your living room. I know it'll probably cost you like $10 more than it cost me to get Mouse Guard, but I'm sure you can get it digitally maybe for the same price, Comixology or something. Read this Mouse Guard. Holy shit. This game just makes the Mouse Guard comic happen so easily and so quickly that it's almost amazing. Right, and the key mechanic in this game is that it's a turn-taking game. Not in the same way the other ones are turn-taking. It's GM turn, player turn. GM turn, player turn, right? And it starts with the GM's turn. So when the GM's turn, the GM throws stuff at the, at the mice, right? It's like, oh, it's a mice. Now it is time for you to deal with the badger. Oh yes, the badger is chasing you. What will you do? Oh, you survived barely, but you lost your sword when you stabbed the badger. Now what will you do? As it rains, it makes everything muddy. Yes, you are tiny mice. Mud is a big problem. A big problem. Oh, you escaped onto the beach where there is no mud, but there are crabs. Yes, what will you do about the crabs? Oh, you cut off their eye stalk. Oh, you managed to escape. Okay, that is all I can think of now. I am the GM. It is now your turn, mice. What will you do? During my turn, you little mice earned some number of clicks based on your role playing, right? If you role play well enough, you can earn more clicks. And the number, I think it's checks, actually. It Whatever. is checks. Checks. You earn checks. And I you wasn't going to correct you on stage. Whatever. You, the you can use the checks during the mice turn to do stuff. Okay, so it's like, okay, mice, it's your turn. What'd you get? Three checks? What are you going to do with the three checks, mice? Okay, one, you're going to get a new sword. Yeah, you left that one in the badger. Yeah, that's what I thought. Two, what else? Oh, some shoes, yeah, you're gonna go buy shoes to deal with, you know, the mud that's gonna happen again. And three, oh, you're gonna heal that wound you got from the crab fight, yeah? Oh, is it my turn again? Oh, you're on the Mice Beach Resort, and it's high tide! <laughs> oh, what now, Mice? That's pretty much how the game goes. Now look at this economy. You play d d you have the situation again where someone, someone's rolling a whole bunch of dice because they're louder than everyone else. You have to earn the right to roll the dice in this game. As a result, every time you roll dice, it fucking matters. In d and I roll d20 a thousand times, and maybe the average of all those rolls causes an impact on the game. This maybe game, one of those rolls would be super big and have everyone at the table going, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, right? But every single roll in this game is oh shit, especially when you only get like two or three and you earned a check and you're gonna make a roll for it. It's like, okay, I earned the right to roll the dice to try to get shoes. I didn't get the shoes. <laughs> when we I don't get the check game. back. When we played D&D, I would just like literally fall asleep during combat. I was like, oh, I play a pacifist, my character runs away and hides until it's over, and I fall asleep. And no one was really paying attention when it wasn't their turn. I think some of you were in that boat, too. In this game, when someone's like, I'm gonna roll some dice, everyone kind of stands up like, oh, we're rolling dice. They stand there, and everyone watches silently while you like, prepare to roll your dice. It's a big deal. Big deal. The Burning Wheel. Is anyone here? I'm just curious. Raise your hands if you've heard of The Burning Wheel. Oh, no, okay. Not All right. zero. This is the game. It's the game. We have a little bit of time, short story time. So many of you have probably had that sort of the feminine mystique, but it's the gamer mystique, that you're playing D&D &D with your friends. You're not having a good time at that point, because combat's in a sixth hour, and, and you don't really have any input in the combat anymore. And you know that guy, right? There's always that guy who tries to make his own, his hack on D&D, &D, or he makes his own role. Guys, I fix D&D. &D. We use D30s instead of D20s. <laughs> yeah, he never fixes it. Never fixes it. And if you go to a gaming convention, especially smaller gaming conventions, those guys have tables everywhere. They're trying to come around. Come play you. my game, come play my game, please. I'm you gotta game. avoid those people like Grim Death. <laughs> so I was at this convention in New Jersey called like UberCon. I went by myself and I'm walking around. One of those guys grabbed me, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting at his table, ready for some misery. And the game was actually really cool. I'd never seen anything like it before. So I was playing D&D under the philosophy of, yeah, all games are the same bullshit as D&D. I gotta play something, right? I'm not gonna play one of those weird hacks these weirdos made, right? Play enough of those. Everyone knows D&D, we're sticking with it. So I come back, I'm like, you gotta come to this con if that weird guy's isn't there again. We're gonna play his game. Yeah, listen, I don't trust any weird guy's game. It probably is awful. I think the only game to play, so you can make fun of me later. So we go back and we play this game. Well, you game. know, I have a, you know, but no, don't knock it if you haven't tried it policy. Yeah. Right? It's like, I haven't tried Australia. I didn't form an opinion on it until now. <laughs> <laughs> that was ominous. <laughs> so we also grab our friend Pete, who played Mustafa bin Mustafa. And we all go back. And this was before there. he was Mustafa bin Mustafa, by the way. So we get there, and we're ready to play this game. And the guy, the guy Luke Crane, who made this game, hands his three character sheets, and goes away and says, I gotta go to the bathroom, I'll be right back, and you play. So, so we're waiting, we're looking at our character sheet. Do you have a picture of the character sheet? I don't have a picture of the character okay, sheet. Okay, so at the top of the burning wheel character sheet, the first thing, the first thing in the character sheet is beliefs and instincts, three of each. And it pretty much says on my character sheet, you are the human thief. 
you need to get money or else the mafia boss is going to chop off your feet. I think it was arms. It doesn't matter. Hands, something. He was going to chop something off, and I didn't want that to happen. I'm playing the elf because that's what I do. I'm that kind. Of, I'm one of those people. Uh, the elf. I love nothing more than to sit for four hours role playing high elven court bullshit. <laughs> so I'm reading the elf sheet, and it's like that dwarf's family abandoned that sword, and they will not get it back ever. Your uncle, blah 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 blah. And I look at Pete, who hasn't even looked at his character. Who's the sheet, dwarf? And I'm like, you don't deserve that sword. We don't know the rules of this game. All we read is the little belief section on the character sheet. We don't know how to play this game. We don't even know what kind of dice so we need. So he looks at me, he looks at his character sheet, goes, looks back at me and says, Your father betrayed my father! <laughs> this starts getting pretty heated. And Luke Crane, we realize he's back. So we stop, we're like, okay, we're ready to start. And he says, oh, proceed. <laughs> the game tricked us into role playing just from the character sheet. Oh, and by the way, that shit isn't just like flavor text. There's rules about that stuff. Right. There are so many things, we don't have time to get into every aspect of Burning Wheel. Burning Wheel is like the, it's a big book, right? Most of these other games we've told you about, except maybe Mouse Guard, which is mo sort of Burning Wheel based, are little tiny books, right? Like little tiny mice. Yeah, Burning Wheel is a big book. About half of it is just the character, like, life pads and things for making characters, but it's still big. You need to be hardcore to learn all the rules of Burning Wheel. I don't even know all the rules of Burning Wheel, right? But you can play with just pages 1 through 75. And ignore the rest. So here we're going to go through a bunch of the kind of core mechanics of this game that are interesting and that you might find enlightening. Yeah, yeah and the other reason we use this game is because it's the one we're most familiar with. This is the one we play every other week. And also because a lot of these mechanics that are in Burning Wheel, it's sort of a collection of all the good things from all the indie RPGs. I mean, if we want to sit here for days just talking about indie RPGs, it's like there's thousands of them. But this one really grabs like sort of like the best of out of everything. So uh, item number one, traits. You play the DD game where you write down, my character is six foot eight, his eyes, he's an elf. His eyes are, I guess, purple with gold flecks. I guess that's the popular elf yeah. eye color. Does that ever matter? No, it never matters. You can make it matter in the sort of, you know, make up your own rules way, but there's nothing in the book that makes that matter. So in this game, you can say your character's hairy. It doesn't mean anything. If you buy the trait hairy, which costs a point, your character is hairy. He exemplifies hairy. If it ever matters, in the game, Harry is now a mechanic for him. So you write Harry on your character sheet. Anything in your character sheet matters in the game. So you're sitting there, and it's like, you want to make a disguise as a gorilla, right? And I'm like, it says Harry in my character sheet. I want an advantage die. And the GM is like, yeah, you're Harry. There's a plus one to disguise skill test on, because you're Harry. So suddenly, you, you're forced, you don't have that many points to spend on this stuff. Suddenly, instead of writing down all this crap about your uncle Calvin Blackstaff, you write down the parts of your character that matter the most. It's too easy to make a smorgasbord character in D&D. You don't write out this big, long history. You just put in the important bits, and everything else will get filled in as you play. What matters more, that my character's fat or that he's hairy? And I have to decide, and whichever one I pick, that's going to be in the game. It's on my character sheet. It matters. It can also come to bite you. It'd be like, oh, the boat's getting a little, you know, get a little water in that boat. Uh, yeah. And Rim, you're kind of fat. That was oh, funny. you're running out of food. And Rim, you're kind of fat. <laughs> <laughs> Just get back to my uncle, Kelvin Blackstaff. In this game... You can spend 15 resource points, and Kelvin Blackstaff, this great and powerful wizard, is your goddamn uncle. It oh, he's matters. a wizard? I thought he was me. He's a wizard. Okay. You can roll dice to make him appear. You go to the game master and say, Kelvin Blackstaff is at, happens to be at this inn. He has to let you roll dice to make that happen. Yeah, you, it might be really hard to make that succeed, but the more points you put into it during character creation, the easier it'll be. Now, here's where you can see where this game is going. It costs 15 points for Kelvin Blackstaff, the great wizard, to be my uncle. 14 points for him to also hate me. Oh yeah, he's definitely at this inn. Shit. It's really easy to make him show up at the inn. One point easier, but... It's cheaper to bring people in that hate you than like you, but simultaneously it's not that much cheaper because people who hate you are just as interesting as people who like you. <laughs> Failure and success are equally interesting. How many of you, when you tell the story of a DD and d game you played, you tell the story where you fucked up and the town got exploded? Yeah. Freaking natural 20, you chop the dragon's head off. Not an exciting story, right? Natural 1, something horrible happened. That's the story that you tell, right? And Burning Wheel makes that happen every time. Because like Mouse Guard, right, every roll matters. In D&D, you want to climb over the town wall to sneak in, right? All right, I roll my d20. You roll your climb test, okay? You succeed or fail. If you succeed, you get into the town by climbing over the wall. If you fail, all right, you fail. Maybe there's falling damage? 
Maybe. Okay. In this game, if you fail, failure matters. Failure scars your character. If right, you so get stabbed with a sword, you might never walk again. Right. There are two rules that make this happen. Rule number one is any failed roll has a consequence. If it wasn't a consequence, you should have just said yes. It's called say yes or roll the dice. If a character wants to do something, climb over the wall. The GM either says, yes, you climb over the wall, continue, right? Or roll the dice, we're going to find out. And if you succeed, you succeed. And if you fail, oh, do you fail. Something bad happens when you fail. It might not be immediate, right? But if something bad will happen for every failed roll, there will be a consequence, and then usually another roll to deal with the consequence, right? Rule number two, let it ride, right? d and I take 10, I take 20. Let it ride is like, no, you failed to climb over the wall. You may not try to climb over the wall again unless it's a completely different circumstance, right? Like you got a rope. Or you, it's now daytime in the town, someone's helping you. Or, Never know. again, the game master continuing to roll, make you roll stealthy until you eventually fail, and you can do the thing he's been planning to do all along. Right, it's like you succeeded at your stealthy, you are now stealthy until the situation changes pretty significantly. You're just hidden, period. End of story. Now, we're only about five minutes left, so we're going to move a little more quickly. Three more really interesting mechanics. One, currency, buying stuff, that's a stat. I roll that just like everything else. Do I want to buy a sword? Well, roll some dice. Yes, I now have a sword. Nope, I couldn't afford it. Advanced oh, you couldn't afford it. By the way, you now have less money. You're taxed. Oh, yeah, I spent all my money. Yeah, there are consequences to failing to buy something, too. Advancement. You advance by failing. It's just like Final Fantasy three or Ultima four. If you want to get good at sword, you gotta fail at rolling sword a bunch of times, and then sword it, gets you better. You have to fail at sword to make sword get better. Just like the real world with practicing. There's actually practicing rules also. Three. There is a really interesting combat system that's really crunchy, and it has this thing where you simultaneously script three actions, then you reveal them one by one. Yeah, like, I, I, you know, I. Slash, and then only well, slash, and then I step back, and then I guard. Yeah, well, I scripted uh, run away, run away, run away, well, you know, whatever we did. Yeah. There is an equally crunchy system for social conflict. I scripted a point, then a rebuttal, then an incite. I did incite, incite, dismiss. Your Mom. mom's a whore, your mom's a duck, get out of here. <laughs> So suddenly, that's a really that, powerful attack. If there's that guy with the bowl stuck on his head, we want to talk about it. We roll literally the same number of dice as we want to kill the guy. And there's also tons and tons of skills to help with that arguing, right? My favorite of which is Ugly Truth, best skill in the game. But there's also persuasion, oratory, coarse persuasion, and stentorious rhetoric, stentorious persuasion, stentorious. Flatulence. The stentorious ones are all for the dwarves, mostly. <laughs> Burning Wheel is the be all end all of everything we're talking about right here. King Arthur Pendragon is the exact opposite of Burning Wheel in every possible way and is just as good. It basically simulates King Arthur's reign. The book on the left has the rules of the game. The book on the right has every year from like before King Arthur was born until way past the end. And you just go page by page. Night simulator. Does your king survive to adulthood? Um, railroad is just built in. If you're vengeful and you want to forgive someone, you might not be allowed to. You just can't. Yeah. The game is just a rail of Arthurian legend. And notice some of these go together, right? If you're more forgiving, you're less vengeful and vice versa. But how about the one if you're more pious, you're less worldly? You might want both of those, but you can't. Lady Blackbird is the same game every time. You have a set of characters with set backstories. You have a setting. It's basically the ship from Firefly. This is Firefly Star Wars the game. You start with these characters, it's always the exact same situation, and you play it out, and it always ends somewhere crazy different every time you play it. Also skyscraper. If you want, it's set in the steampunk world where a planet exploded, and there's all these floating islands, and there's airships to get around. The mechanic that's interesting is the, hey, this is just like that time we did that thing. So if you're in the middle of a situation and you need bonus dice, you turn to the friend with you and say, yo, escaping from these pirates, this is totally just like that time we had to get away from your mom's pirates. Yeah, the sky squid. It, so the, <laughs> the characters' backstories are so simple, and they're given to you. You don't make anything. You don't make a character at all. During the game, you add to the character. You enrich the character in the course of play. Which is great, because there's no preparation like other RPGs. You just sit down, boom, play. Three out of four times I played this, it turned into romantic comedy by the end. <laughs> and in one of them, everybody died. <laughs> Dogs in the vineyard. Your roleplay is Mormons in the middle of nowhere, right? And really, 
Uh, you're not actually Mormons. It's some other fictional religious, you know, really religious kind of sect uh, going on. Uh, but the main mechanic in this game is the bidding, right? You bid higher on every conflict, and it's like, how badly do you want to win this? So you bid it up sort of like in poker, right? It's like, I'll raise, I'll raise, I'll raise, I'll fold, I'll yep. take call. So we're arguing, and then we bid, and we escalate to a fist fight. We escalate to a gunfight. And then he wants to escalate to, like, murdering my whole family. Maybe at this point I back down. Right, so the conflicts that are a bigger deal end up being a bigger deal, and the ones that are less of a deal, no one raises, and you move on quickly. Actual Dungeons and Dragons. If not play, the new Dungeons and Dragons. If you play old Dungeons and Dragons, it is nothing like new Dungeons and Dragons. If I had to say the primary noun, the thing that matters the most in old Dungeons and Dragons, it's the map. Right. We're talking about BECMI Dungeons and Dragons. You know, the Moldvay and Menser ones. If you can't figure out which one that is, ask someone on the internet. Uh, <laughs> In that Dungeons & Dragons, right, it's a lot more like playing NetHack with paper. You draw the map as you reveal it. Your torch lasts for three rounds. Your torch went out. Take the map away from the players because they can't see. Right? That's old D&D, right? It's not so much a role-playing game. You know, it's definitely of, not a combat game. Right? But fight it's definitely not a combat game. You avoid fighting like the plague. You get hardly no experience for fighting. You get all the experience for treasure. One gold piece is worth like ten rats. Right? You want to get in, get the treasure, and get out. So there's a new game which was just kickstarted by, by the same people and the same group that made Burning Wheel called Torchbearer. Which is bringing back that it doesn't have the map. Instead, it has inventory Tetris, like XCOM, right? But it is that same dungeon crawl of the old D&D, of go in, get the treasure, and get out. I'm holding a sword and a lantern. You want to pick up the treasure? <laughs> I put down the sword and pick up the treasure. All right, now there's a bunch of kobolds. Uh, I put down the treasure and the lantern and use two hands. the sword. Kobolds are running away with the treasure. <laughs> it's old D&D, but they minimize the mapping and let you focus on all that other stuff. Action, Action castle. castle. Here's the deal. All right, we got to really quick. This is our last game. We're two we're minutes over. We're so unprofessional. We're basically out of time, right? Sorry, yeah. next people. This is a game. It's, it's like an old text adventure. And the, we played this at our first PAX in 08. We lined everyone up in the room, and one by one, you play a role. So, you are in a small yeah, castle. Yeah, let's do, let's do three turns. All right. Ready? Welcome to Action Castle. Four chance. You're in a small cottage. There is a fishing pole here. Exits are out. Your turn. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I don't understand what. Your turn. Um, kill everything. <laughs> I don't see everything to kill. Your turn. Uh, I walk to the left. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't go left. You get the idea, right? The person running the game there's is a, a text adventure. There's a video. Scott ran this for Game and Tycho at the Q&A. I, but I basically show. raided them at a PAX East Q&A and was just like, welcome to Action Castle, like a fishing pole. Core can see here. You can buy Tycho knew what to do. Game didn't know what to do. You keep in mind on the party. <laughs> Games and you want to try them, email us. We have some business cards we can give out. We don't have enough for everyone. Find us around the con and we will totally. We are not doing anything for the rest of PAX that is on our schedule. We this will totally answer panel. your questions. We're Tell probably going to be in Tabletop for the next two days and we'll be in Melbourne for the next week. So that's that. Thank you all. I don't know how many I have left. Everyone's going to call you on your real phone number in the U.S. I'm sure they're going to pay for that. It's going to happen all the time now. I'm not giving out all my cards. Thanks. I kept you guys thinking about fate. It's all right. I, 